Hey everybody, welcome back to Board and Savior. Today, we are completing an unofficial trilogy of board games. Sure are pretty, huh? <laughs> First, we did top 10 components. These components feel so good to play with, look so pretty nice. Then we did top 10 miniatures. These miniatures look so cool, look so sweet. Everybody wants to touch them. And now we are doing the top 10 most gorgeous games, the prettiest things, all production considered here. Miniatures, components, cards, Everything, every single thing that makes up a game, if it's all great, then it's gonna be on this list. And I think that's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm gonna talk a little bit about like how the games work, how they feel to play, all that stuff. And then we're gonna talk about why it's so beautiful and wonderful and great. And I figure let's just jump right into it with a honorable mention, uh, a two honorable mentions, starting with Scythe. Okay, before I say anything about this game, I'm looking at it and um, I'm, I'm wondering why when I made this list, I didn't put this into the top 10. I don't know what that's about, but we're gonna stick with it. We're gonna trust the plan that we made before uh, we started filming and we're just gonna we're just gonna believe that that Ben was correct about this because geez, I am looking at this and it does not seem like honorable mention material. It seems like top 10 top five material, honestly. But let's talk about Scythe. So Scythe is this weird past, but still like futuristic kind of steampunk world. It's like the 1920s, but there's mechs and people have giant animals that they're like bonded to. And it is just absolutely beautiful. It is, it may look like a, a big fighting game and fighting does come into play a little bit, but really this is a resource gathering and optimization focused and action selection game where it's really just about optimizing your turns and, and doing the best things that you can and kind of building up your ability to do things better and better and better as the game goes on. And sure, you'll punch a guy in the face every once in a while, but mostly you're just collecting resources and, and, you know, upgrading your buildings and upgrading your stuff. And it's a very satisfying game. It's not one of my all-time favorites, personally. Um, I think it feels, it, it feels like it starts to get satisfying and then it ends for me a lot of the time. I wish that it was uh, just a little bit longer or it got going a little bit quicker, but it's still a pretty incredible uh, game as far as gameplay. And then if we look at it, I mean, honorable mention, what am I, what am I talking about, I guess? Uh, every single faction has a unique sculpt of mech. The base game, there are five factions, but there are expansions. You can get a couple others, which also have unique sculpts for the mechs. Unique sculpts for the mechs, and then unique leaders who all have uh, an animal, and then the leader themselves is a, uh, a unique character. Uh, all of these incredible custom wood pieces there's there's these like cylinders and cubes which you come to expect and maybe like this little uh meeple kind of guy not a meeple he's a little pawn sort of but then there's these uh like octagonal uh wood pieces and this windmill and a monument and a mine and all of these pieces all of the wooden workers are unique based on the faction the little cult cut of this is unique by faction there's a bunch of different cards all the card quality is really nice uh all of the the uh, resources are base nice wood pieces but then you can get like an upgrade for them if you want them to be like painted plastic pieces you got coins which have little holes in them i mean come on like this is a a remarkably beautiful like over the top beautiful game and i guess it's just an honorable mention for me so what are you gonna do uh moving along crokinole all right unlike the last one i know exactly why this isn't in the actual top tens and it's just an honorable mention because this isn't really the same thing as the other board games that we're talking about this is you know technically a board but uh it's a, it's a big old wooden thing it's a dexterity game it costs like 150 dollars for a cheap one which is what i have crokinole here is a dexterity based flicking game where you take the discs of your color and you flick them 
If there are no opposing discs, so let's pretend, let's just sh pretend that none of these black discs are here, then when you flick your disc, it has to end up in this central circle. If it doesn't end up fully in the central circle, then it is lost. It doesn't count as a shot and you're gonna like knock it over here into the little gutter. If there are opposing discs on the board as there currently are, in order for your shot to count, you need to hit one of the opposing discs. You do not need to hit that disc directly. So like if I somehow ricocheted this disc that I'm shooting off of this one that's already here of mine and it hit an opposing disc, that's totally fine. As long as an opposing disc gets moved, that's super, super cool. Uh, so let's just for fun, see if I'm good at Crokinole. I'm probably not. I kind of set this up to be a little difficult and this mic is kind of in the way. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I'm gonna try to hit this black one here. I did it. Okay, so that counts. That counted as a shot that was legal. And now that disc can stay on the board. At the end of the game, you count up the discs uh, that were sunk into the center. So any discs that go into the middle, uh, you stick them over here into this little like trap for the 20s because uh, they're worth 20 points. And then you count up all of that. So 20 points for the ones that go in the middle, 15 points in the center circle, uh, 10 points for this middle circle, and five points over here. So you count up all the points for white, all the points for black and then you get the difference and whoever had that difference gets the points. Sounds complicated, it's really not. It is a beautiful thing. And like I said, this is a cheap version of it. This is like 150 bucks. I feel like most of the like, yeah, this is a real Crokinole board. Those cost like $300. And I do someday when I have that kind of disposable income, I do plan to get a like nice $300 board. But even this one, is obviously it's a, it's a huge thing, but I also think it's nice. Um, it's got this like kind of cherry mahogany uh, red wood on the outside. It's got this, uh, this lighter colored yellowy wood on the inside. And I think it looks really, really quite nice. Um, it's got a good weight to it. These pieces are not as beautifully icy sliding like the the super expensive boards but it still feels good to to shoot with them and it's a very satisfying clicky clacky thing and yeah it just like if you see this on the table and you don't know what this game is you are instantly engaged and you want to know what's going on so crokinole my honorable mention number two. And before we head to the regular old top 10, I feel like it would be irresponsible of me not to give you kind of a recap of what's been going on in the board and savior universe. Feel free to skip ahead to the next time code if you hate fun. But if you don't hate fun, then uh, here's here's your little recap of what's been happening. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I am the original Ben. Um, the OG Ben, but there are a bunch of clones of me. I've cloned myself a lot of the times. Uh, and one of those clones is an evil anti me, an anti Ben called Neb. And he's got some kind of like mysterious master plan that we don't know what it is, but it's probably bad. One of my clones went back in time to try to stop that plan from happening. And we don't know how that went yet. That's kind of like a dangling, ooh, how'd that go? Uh, I thought that I had had Neb in prison for the last several months, but oops, turns out it was actually my clone, Ben 2. Hi, I'm Ben 2. That 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 would be him. Uh, Neb switched places with him, and so I imprisoned Ben 2, and Neb has been out doing stuff. Neb was actually the clone who did pretty much the entire top 10 that I did last time, the top 10 miniatures. That was pretty much all Neb. Uh, and I also found out that he made a clone after that top 10 ended. Uh, additionally, there's a prophecy, and we don't know what that says yet. So there's kind of a lot going on, but... Um, if you just play along, I'm sure you'll have a blast. And uh, back to the top 10. Number 10, Catacombs, third edition. I didn't do this on purpose, but it is two dexterity disc flicking games back to back. So uh, that's kind of weird, but here we are. Catacombs, this is Catacombs, third edition. Uh, if you've ever seen the box for, I think it's the second edition of Catacombs, this is uh, a pretty significant shakeup in terms of like art style. Uh, it's a lot more, 
geometric, kind of stylized, cartoony. Uh, the other, at least Catacombs box, was super like scary looking and intense. This one is more in line with how the game feels to play, which is like a silly cartoon fantasy kind of world with all sorts of crazy different uh, heroes and baddies that you gotta fight. So basically how Catacombs works is that one player is the overseer, the evil person who is setting up almost almost like a dungeon master, a challenge for the rest of the players to get through. And an official like real game of catacombs takes you through several uh, rooms of the catacombs up until you fight like a big final boss. And as you go, you are using all kinds of abilities and uh, there's a cat and you are additionally buying and gaining new items so that you can like upgrade your things and do better. I feel like some of these pieces are going to be hitting the floor before this discussion is done. We'll see. Um, but uh, yeah, you start out with like kind of classic fantasy archetypes. Like right here in front of me, I've got Illyria, the elf, and she has elven arrows and a spirit familiar. And there's like a barbarian and a wizard. There's also a chicken, uh, I believe a rooster named Rusan. And uh, it's it's a very silly, fun little game. And all of the, the rooms there are kind of like special specific baddies based on the given room. So like this is a kind of fiery cavern place. There's scorpions, there's all these like fire elemental creatures. It's uh, it's very deep, very thorough. There are a bunch of, not only in like the base game, there's a bunch of stuff and like this is a pretty sizable, sizable box here. Um, but in addition to the base game, there's a million expansions that add all kinds of other uh, unique villains and new characters and it's just there's a lot going on and whatever kind of fantasy story you'd like to tell there's probably components in the box to do it uh and like i said it's a dexterity based flicking game there's all kinds of different pieces and uh they will work in different ways like some characters shoot tiny little discs that are arrows and you got to try to hit uh, enemies with the arrows. Some of them, you flick the, the character themselves because they're like a melee-based character and they're going to go wail on somebody. And uh, there's a whole bunch of weird different ways that they use discs to not just always be the exact same thing. And then there are, in some of the maps, like these obstructions that are placed actually in the board, like they slot into the board so they don't move um, when you hit them with something. And it's, it's a really, I don't know, it's a unique board game that's unlike anything else in my collection. That is a little bit why it's on this list here, and it's also why it's number 10, because I don't know if it's quite as beautiful as some of the other games, including, honestly, Scythe, which we've already seen, but it's so incredibly unique, and the art is really nice, and all the components are extremely nice, uh, but I think what really sells it is how completely different than anything else in my collection it is. Like, this is something that when it's set up on the table, you're like, oh, that's new. I haven't seen that one before. That stands out and looks different than anything else that you've got. Uh, and uh, there's there's all sorts of things. There's like range tools and big cone damage. And even this was in my top 10 components video, a gelatinous cube miniature that you're trying to like flick onto different sides because the different sides have different special abilities. You can like gobble up pieces and dissolve them in your acid stomach. Uh, there's a ton. There's a ton here, and all of it is very fun. Uh, yeah, Catacombs 3rd Edition, number 10. Number 9, Vagrant Song. I hope you are in the mood to get spooky, because there's a couple freaking ghosts on this train. Uh, namely, the haints that are the, the central driving mechanism of each scenario of Vagrant Song. You play as one of a bunch of different train-hopping hobos that are aboard this uh, ghostly train, and each scenario, there is a different haint that you need to help them restore their humanity before they can take all of yours away and make you dead. Uh, and each of these haints plays extremely differently. And no, the map does not change from game to game. There are uh, different like terrain pieces that you'll be putting out, but it's just these three train cars. But the 
spirits, these haints themselves are going to change how they work so significantly that it's not going to, at least for me, it's not going to get repetitive and start feeling like uh, you're just doing the same thing over and over again. These haints are so unique and different and they shake things up so much uh, that it's, it's, it's not an issue that it's like the same map every time, basically. How do these haints work? That is a very interesting note because these haints they come with a, a scenario book, and in that scenario book, they tell you what these little chips do for that specific haint. There are chips with uh, five different symbols. There's nails, candle, apple, salt, and a rabbit's foot. And depending on which one of these chips you pull out, the haint will do an associated action. That is, it's based exclusively for that haint, and if you pull that same chip for a different haint, they'll do something else. Uh, and so you never know exactly what they're gonna do on any given turn, which makes this bag an unpredictable little thing that can either be something where you're like, okay, we could handle that one, but some of them you're like, oh, you, oh, you're doing the one that you, I could, didn't want you to pull. The other thing that's fun about this little bag is that as you're rummaging around the train looking for items, you pull things from this bag too. This very same bag that may be hurting you can help you. And like, I just pulled these iron nails, which says a haint within range two gains two humanity. That is kind of how Vagrant Song works generally there's a lot more there's like events there's all sorts of things but now let's talk a little bit about the uh the aesthetics this is classic kind of rubber hose style artwork. You've seen it in Cuphead. You can see it in another board game, Townsfolk Tussle, which I do not have, but a very charming kind of like 30s, I guess, 30s, 40s animation style with their, their floppy arms and uh, a, a very unique and specific look. But combined with this creepy, spooky uh, uh, theme, it works really, really well, because there are some there are some real spooky things that crop up in this game, but it's all sort of through this lens of a cartoony, fun look. And so even though things can get creepy and spooky, things still feel fun, and I don't know, you still want to put on like the, the old-timey phonograph music while you're playing this game and and have like kind of a, a pep in your step as you as you play. Another thing that I have to point out, which is a small thing that maybe only I care about, these dice, which are called bones, no, there's not too many of them, ha ha ha, board game jokes. Um, these dice are just freaking great. They're like the perfect level of roundedness, so they feel kind of like they're worn, um, and they are, they're like this lovely off-white color, so they feel old. They feel like dice that you might happen upon on an old derelict ghost train, honestly, and it's a small touch, but I think it's really wonderful. The last thing that I have to say, I simply must mention, is these little heart tokens which is used to track the humanity of the uh, the haints and the train hoppers. They are great. They're like the little jewels that you would find in like an amusement park if you go to a theme park and it's like, fill this little bag of jewels for $7. I was always uh, drawn very much to those those uh, <laughs> those particular gift shops. So it speaks to me specifically. Uh, and I don't know, that's Vagrant Song. I think it looks in incredible, just a beautiful, unique, special game that I, I'm so happy every time I look at it. And now, not to not to put this to a, a, a down note, not to end this on a down note, but I have a bit of a problem in a bit of a pickle, because as we know, the evil Neb is loose and he's being a, a bad baddie. And I want to figure out which clone he is, but clones, right? They all kind of look the same. So, I'll have to go one by one. Now, which one are you? I mean, just look at me. I'm, I'm sleepy, Ben. Number eight, the Quacks of Quedlinburg. Okay, um, you are, you're in the process of commenting Quacks of Quedlinburg over Scythe and Hay. That's fair. That, that's, a, that's a fair critique that you are levying against me, um, but hear me out, all right? First, well, first of all, I'm kind of with you, and maybe I was a little insane when I made this list, but 
I also sort of still agree with myself, and I'll explain why after I do my my usual spiel uh, explaining how Quacks of Quedlinburg works. If you are one of the people in the world who does not know how this super, super popular game works, uh, I will, I'll give you a brief little explanation. Quacks of Quedlinburg, you and your friends are alchemists trying to brew the best potions possible. There's this potion track, this swirling, bubbling track, and your goal is to put out ingredients uh, and get as far along this track as you can each round. The further along you get, the better uh, victory points you'll get, the more gems you'll get to do things, and the more money you'll get to buy ingredients to put into your little ingredient satchel. Every single turn, you are going to draw ingredients from your bag until you stop or until something stops you. And these ingredients have numbers on them from one to four. Four, I believe. I don't think anything goes higher than four, right? No. Uh, so one to four, and then you look at that number. This one is a three, and you count one, two, three from this starting droplet, and then that's how it works every time. If I drew another three, I would place it here, and then so on and so forth. You get the picture. It's counting. Um, you draw ingredients for as long as you please. Why would you ever, ever want to stop, I think you're wondering? And the answer is very simple. You are dealing with relatively volatile chemicals here. Uh, crazy ingredients, uh, uh, garden spiders and crow skulls. Those things, believe it or not, actually not that dangerous. What is dangerous that you're pulling out are cherry bombs. You are putting cherry bombs into your potion, and they're great because they, uh, they, they help you rack up the points, but if you put too many cherry bombs into your potion, uh, kaboom, blows up in your face, and you get fewer benefits in gaming terms if your potion blows up. If you're able to get uh, very far away from the starting starting spot on your potion track and it doesn't blow up, you get uh, a couple of benefits. And if it blows up, you have to choose which benefit you want. And it hurts your soul because you want everything. You want to be able to do it all. So you don't want your potions to blow up, but you also want to get real close. <laughs> you want to you wanna be right at the precipice. Um, so uh, it's not just that, though. Uh, that you, may, you may be thinking, wow, that sounds a little too simple for me. No, no, no. The cherry bombs blow up your potion, the pumpkins do nothing, but all of the other ingredients have beneficial effects, either when you pull them out of your bag or at the end of each round. They'll do things like getting you more rubies, getting you more points, getting you more ingredients to pull from your bag, all sorts of different things. And that is where I think this game really sings in like cultivating what you want your, your bag to do best, um, while also mitigating the possibility of drawing cherry bombs. Like every, every new ingredient you add that's not a cherry bomb helps you stay away from explosion and lets you get further and further along and build things up bigger and bigger, which is a delight. Um, the last thing I'll mention, and it'll help us transition into talking about the looks of this game, is this little flask over here. This, this thing that you can pour into your potion. You can pour this into your potion to neutralize the effects of the last cherry bomb that you played. You stick it back into your bag. You cannot use this to avoid an explosion because the explosion has already happened. It's, it's too late, no going back. But assuming you've pulled out a cherry bomb that has not caused your thing to explode, you can pour this in and it will neutralize it and then you can, you can go back to pulling and maybe things will last a little bit longer before everything blows up. Why does this thing exemplify the glories of Quacks of Quedlinburg? Why? Because it's a freaking cardboard token in the shape of a, a potion vial, but it's not just that. It is full on this side when you've got it to use, and then you pour it in, you flip it over, and it's empty, and that is how it stays on your player board. And if that isn't the most whimsical, unnecessary, silly little thing in a board game. I don't know what is. And it is, it's just like, it just fills my heart with excitement and wonder. Uh, and all of this is like this. Like, you're looking at these ingredients. These are like essence of ghost or like ghost farts or ghost screams or something. You've got toadstools. You've got these garden spiders, crow skulls, all mandrakes, like all of these different ingredients that just make you feel like an alchemist 
alchemist brewing your little brew, making your little potion, and they all have, you know, their unique artwork and all of that stuff. There is, of course, as we've mentioned a few times here, uh, I'm a big fan of plastic gems, and this game has those. And additionally, there's a little catch-up mechanic. If you are falling behind in the game, don't worry about it, baby. Just throw some rat tails into your potion. If you look at the scoring track, the difference, uh, the, the rat tails between where your score marker is and the player in front of you, that's how many rat tails you can throw into your brew and give you a head start on your potion making to help you catch up and get a little bit closer to that first player, uh, the player who's, who's winning. And it's rat tails, and there's on the scoring marker, there's little rats, and you gotta count up the tails that you can throw into your potion. It is a fantastical, whimsical, wonderful party, and I just, I can't get enough of it. And, uh, and then there's also like just the art style of this game in particular. I feel like it looks like a bunch of other Euro games. There's kind of a look that a lot of Euro games have, and it might be the same artist, I'm not entirely sure. But there's a there's a look that just fits so well. It puts you into this colorful, bustling, uh, uh, alchemy, wondrous space, and it just it just sings. Scythe is indeed the sleeker, sexier thing, but this just. Like, it's like a bubbling up of excitement and wonder inside of my heart, and I love it. Quacks of Quedlinburg, number eight. Number seven, Wingspan. Okay, before I talk about Wingspan, I just, I have to say, I feel like it's my responsibility. This is, this is too many birds. It's, it's just, it's simply too many. The expansions make this deck get bigger, and, um... It's just too much. I can't handle it. I think I think I'm uncomfortable knowing that that many birds exist in the world. It's just a lot. I I don't know. I'm I'm grappling with it right now and I want you to grapple with it with me. Let's talk about wingspan and how it works. Basically, very simple. All you're going to do, you've got a little supply of cubes. These represent the actions that you can take each round. Uh, so right now I've got 6 actions available to me that will be used in subsequent turns. Uh, you take one of your cubes and you put it in, into one of four spaces on your player board. Either the space that lets you play a bird. You've got birds in your hand, you play it down, you pay the cost associated, and then boom, you got a bird. Or you can gain food from the bird feeder. Remember I, I talked about the cost associated with getting birds to put up? That's because they need food. They need to be fed because it's an animal. An animal need to eat. That's just science. So you can uh, you can gain food that you can use to feed birds. You can also lay eggs on birds, which um, it's the birds laying the eggs, but I like the visual of me laying eggs on birds. I think that's amusing. Please picture that now. Here's a moment, and I hope you had fun. Finally, you can uh, draw bird cards either from the face up or from the big old stack of birdies. And then you've got more cards in your hand and you can say, wow, this doesn't really fit into my strategy because there's a million cards and I need to find one specific thing. Maybe I shouldn't have specialized so much. You may be thinking that that all, that all sounds a little bit too simple, but what if I told you about brown powers? It sounds like a poop thing. It's not. Uh, whenever you take any of these actions, the gain food, lay eggs, or draw bird cards actions, you also activate any brown powers in the row. And the reason that it specifies brown is that there are also like pink powers, which do other things that'll specify when you get to use those. But the brown powers uh, have like a when activated benefit, which could be gaining food from the supply, or uh, even potentially if you have like a predatory bird, looking at the next bird in the stack. And if it's small enough, that predatory bird eats it and you get some points for your trouble. Now, let's talk about the glorious production of this game because we had to get a Stonemeyer game in here somewhere, right? We, 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 we kind of uh, snubbed Scythe, and so Wingspan, don't you worry, it's here. Okay, first of all, a Dice Tower bird feeder? Okay, but there's more. Wooden dice with adorable little symbols on them for all kinds of different food? <laughs> so far, so good. But wait, there's more. Um, these, I mean, the bird cards, like the cards themselves, extremely high quality. Uh, the eggs, it's, it, I think most people would agree that the eggs are the most incredible component in this game. But if you've seen my top 10 components video, you know that my actual favorite component is uh, the rule book over here, which is the 
most luxurious rule book I have ever had the pleasure to read. It feels so good in your hands. I don't know what to call this texture other than real good like it. So that's what we're going to call it. And uh, yeah, it's just like every aspect of the game with the exception i think of these little resources like they're just cardboard tokens not to say that that's bad but just compared to everything else and how incredible it all is it does pale in comparison but across the board this production is just immaculate like everything about it feels super high quality uh and it just it's a joy to play i mean like this is, it's its so unnecessary to do this kind of thing, but this is your your like little journal where you're annotating all the birds that you're seeing. And it's it looks like a journal. It looks like a little leather bound journal and you open it up at the start of every game to say, okay, let's find some birds today. They didn't need to do that. This could have been a black background or, or the same thing on both sides or something, but no, it's a little, it's a nice little touch, right? It's a nice little touch. Um, so yeah, that's gonna be Wingspan, a game that I think is, it's not, uncommon to be seen on these kind of lists, but it is really that good. It looks that good. It feels that good. So wingspan number seven, I think. Number six, Root. Rudy Toot Toot, Rudy Toot Toot. We are the boys of the Boy Scout troop. We don't smoke and we don't chew and we don't date those that do. Just something to think about. This is Root, a uh, pretty heavy war game. Not as heavy as some other war games I know, but it's heavy for the kind of games that I usually play and my pals usually play. So I'm gonna call it heavy. And if it's not heavy for you, good for you. You're better than me. And you should leave a comment about how you are better. Um, Root, all these factions are extremely different, play very differently, but all with the same goal of getting a bunch of victory points, or there's also dominance cards, but that only matters if you're good at Root, and I'm not, so I just do the victory points, <laughs> that's what I pay attention to. Um, it's multiple ways to win, but the victory points is the easy one to wrap your head around. Eerie Dynasty, they're birds, they build up a, a crazy decree where they do a whole bunch of actions on every turn, but if they ever can't do it, they lose a lot of victory points. Mechanical, no, that's the AI. The Marquita Cat is uh, these cute little kitties who are also angry and mean, and they suck. Uh, and I hate them because I like the Eerie. They spread out all over the board to start with, and but they're spread out so thin. The area are concentrated, and there's a lot of them, but there's, they're spread out so thin, but they're everywhere. Oh my gosh, it's a fun little uh, puzzle. What, what are you going to do about that? Then the Vagabond is a single little character who goes around to all the different clearings and says, pss, pss, I'm going to aid you. Pss, pss, I'm going to mess you up. I'm going to do this. And uh, Vagabond is... Uh, people people either love or hate the Vagabond. I think he's, he's a fun little guy. He's got a whole bunch of tools that let him do all kinds of different things move or have extra things in his bag or attack or uh, gain or have extra slots for his thing whatever it's a uh, it, it, vagabond is wildly different than the like war game that's playing out between the Erie and the Marquis and then finally the Woodland Alliance this little rebellious group that is trying to uh, save the clearing from either the Marquis who's trying to take everything over or the Erie who's been here forever uh, and they play super differently as well they're like trying to drum up support for their grassroots organization basically and that's all I'm going to tell you about how this thing plays because there's a lot more it's a pretty dense game but suffice to say a pretty good one let's talk about component quality uh, as you can see it's not like a, a super opulent game it's kind of understated but I think that is it, it doesn't need to be a, a huge game and it does so much with these simple uh, cardboard pieces and these wooden meeples this box not very big and it packs a whole lot in this is a rare example of a game that like doesn't there's no air in the box like you just pack everything up and then the box closes and that's it there's nothing there's no space wasted this is a very economical kind of game where every single part that is in here is meant to be in here and it feels like that while you're playing 
all of these pieces instantly look different. You can glance at the board and see where everybody is and see all the different factions and how everything is spread out at any given time. Plus, they are just uh, delightful. They, they have kind of the, the quacks of Quedlinburg, just like excitement and glee when I get to play with the uh, Marquis or the Eerie or, or any of them. They all look so unique and striking and uh, there, there's so much personality on a thing that is just a painted piece of wood and then there is like a tiny simple face. Like these guys look so sneaky and evil and plotting. These guys look like their, their facial expression makes me think that they are old and they've been here a while and they're kind of like grizzled and they are they're they're a little bit more like stuck in their ways the vagabond he's a little curious guy and he's a little opportunistic he's looking all around and then the adorable little woodland alliance their adorability hides within them a fighting spirit and woodland alliance can be a real problem speaking from experience all of that is really something that just like works together to be kind of like I said for uh, Quacks, just so charming. And like I talked about for um, Vagrant Song, the juxtaposition between the thinky strategy of the war game and these adorable little pieces that you just want to be like, oh, look at this. It is something that makes a complicated game a lot more palatable for myself and for my gaming group. I think it's always just a little bit easier to sell a heavy game when the theme is as cute as this one is. I think that all works super duper well. Also, just this artwork is unlike typical artwork that I've seen. There's a sketchy nature to it, almost a comic book-y nature. Like, I could easily see a graphic novel taking place in the world of Root and it being fantastic. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just think all of these pieces really sing a super unique art style, understated but quality pieces, and uh, yeah, so we've got Root here at number six. All right, so I figure I'm gonna run you through some security questions. Just kind of make sure you are who you say you are. So, uh, trench coat Ben, what was the name of your first pet? My answer is the same as yours, truffles. Hmm. Yeah, collective memory. Okay, this isn't gonna work. Number five, raptor. Here's the thing, games do not need to be big to be beautiful, and you may be looking at this and saying it is neither big nor beautiful, but I disagree, and it's on my list, and this is, it is my list, I get to make the choices, so hold on, I'll, I'll explain the game and then I'll explain why I think it's so lovely. Um, Raptor, game between the raptors and scientists, scientists trying to capture the little baby raptors, bring them back to the lab so that they can, you know, do scientist things, probably extract their DNA and make more raptors, whatever they do, whatever scientists do. And the raptors are trying to escape the little babies, these little half moon circles on the uh, the edges of the board that will allow the babies to delve deeper into the wilds and avoid human captivity and all that good stuff. The uh, main thrust of the game is this little deck of cards for each player for each side. These are cards numbered one to nine, and all of the cards, except for the nine, have an ability on them as well. This is such a fantastic mechanism. Both players select cards and then simultaneously reveal them. The player who played the higher number card gets to do a number of like basic actions equal to the difference between the numbers. So let's say one player played an eight and the other player played a four. Then the player who played the eight gets to take four actions. Eight minus four, four actions. Four actions do all kinds of stuff. It's those actions that'll really help you like win the game. Game. It's the things that'll let you like move and put baby raptors to sleep or move baby raptors off of the board. But the other player, the player who played the lower number, gets to take the action on the card. And the actions on the card are range from like pretty good to very, 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 very good. And it is so exciting trying to figure out exactly what card your opponent's gonna play so you can do either thing that you want to do. Sometimes you want to take the action on the card. Sometimes you want to be able to take the actions that you get from playing the higher card. It's great. 
I hate that sound. There was just the sound of a board game falling over. The cat is being such a problem in this video. I don't know if you've noticed. Ah, <sighs> um, let's talk about the beauty of this game. It is a, it's a pretty small game. It comes in this like little box. It's not very expensive. I don't remember how much I got this copy for, probably like 30, 35 bucks, something like that. Very affordable, very uh, uh, small footprint in my collection. But I just feel like every part of this is told with such a loving care for the genre, for the, like the adventure, uh, hacking through the bushes genre. I really like all of the components. It feels pulpy. It feels like you're you're like living a uh, a choose your own adventure book about scientists finding raptors in the jungle. It's, I don't know, it, does, it doesn't need to be the most like glorious look for, for it to work for me. These cards are nice, but they're not like incredible. These are just cardboard tokens. These are just like not even thick cardboard player boards. They're just like paper player boards. But I don't know, it all comes together for me into like, I don't want any more from this. These these dinky, like, uh, cardboard rocks, I'm like, yeah, that's right. That feels right for this. It feels like a, like a, a B-movie adventure kind of thing. It, it just works for me. And I think you are not wrong if you're sitting there thinking, how is this above any of these games? How did Scythe not get on the list if this is on the list? That's reasonable, but this is my list and I just love this look of this game. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything else to say. I like the artwork on these cards too. I'll show it off. Um, the artwork is actually really nice. I think it, it looks, is this Vincent Dutrait? I don't know. It might be. It looks great. And uh, yeah, Raptor number five, moving on. Number four, Harrow County. I just realized that this is the second game that I'm gonna need to say the word haint for, because Vagrant Song, you're you're restoring the humanity to the haints, and then in this one, you're trying to take out the opposing haints, because it's all it's all haints. My guess, my if if you have a haint in your game, it's probably gonna get on this list uh, when I when I make it again in a couple years. I don't know. It's a haint thing. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. This is Harrow County, a game. <laughs> of gothic conflict. And uh, it is a vastly asymmetrical game. There are uh, kind of three main factions. The thrust of the game is like a two player game against uh, like from with one faction fighting another faction. Um, but uh, you can also play it three player if you want to throw in Hester, who is a witch that lives in a tree that is a tree and the tree and Hester are one and it's a tree. Uh, additionally, there is a fourth player expansion, optionally, uh, the Fair Folk, but mostly I think this game is like gonna be known as like a two player game, playing either the Protectors or the Family or Kami uh, against each other. And they all play super, super differently. Like the protectors here, you're trying to build a path to these uh, townspeople and get them to safety. Then the family is trying to build a path of storms to these houses on the other end of the board. Uh, and Cami is doing something else. And uh, Hester's spreading roots out all over the place and trying to trying to infect haints with her her little worms. Which, by the way, I'll show a shot of it. Uh, they're little worms that you actually stick into the ears of the haints. Which is, I mean, it's that that'll transition us to why this game is so beautiful. This is not one that I need to be like, hey, I'm defending myself here. No, this is pretty clearly a gorgeous game. All of these pieces are beautiful. Uh, there are, I, I guess technically there are like little miniatures. The haints are classic, you know, plastic miniatures, but pretty much everything else is just a beautiful wooden or cardboard piece. And it all just sings. Also, the Ooh yeah, factor is is high in this game because there are these pieces that slot into the player boards and 
ooh, yeah. Uh, it's always good to have little tokens that slot into a double-layer player board. We all we all like that in the board game sphere. There's these nice, chunky, wooden uh, mason jars. You've got your... You've got this, like, lantern that's great. These freaking storm hexes are awesome awesome and it's just across the board like a super high quality game these uh screen printed wooden pieces with the the different you know uh, protect what are they called the the different like leaders heroes well i don't remember what they're specifically called but the the like main characters that you're playing as uh from any different faction they're printed on there the houses have printed on this is the Deluxe. It's not like the highest level from the Kickstarter, but it is the deluxe version. I imagine that like the retail version, probably it's more like cardboard uh, tokens for for things instead of the the wood pieces. So know that if you're considering buying this, that this is not the retail version. Um, but I think the highest tier deluxe Kickstarter, these are like metal or something. And uh, I don't know. I like the wood. I like the wood a lot. Additionally. I mean, if you've been on this channel for any amount of time, you know that Shogun is a game that I love a ridiculous amount, not because it's particularly beautiful, it will not be on this list, uh, but because of the cube tower, and this game's got one of those too. And that does add to the aesthetics because it's built into the box. Whoa, cubes come out of box. One thing, one little knock that I have on the uh, the, the feeling. This little tray down here, supposed to catch cubes. It does not catch all the cubes as you just saw, and that is pretty consistent. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be rather hit or miss. But on the other hand, the actual cube tower inside of this thing does an incredible job of uh, catching cubes. I just poured four in, and two came out, and there's a bunch currently in there. A a bunch. A b <laughs> more. <laughs> There's more. There's more. There's so many in there, and they're all caught and trapped up real good. Uh, so you you never know what's gonna come out, which is exactly what you want out of a cube tower. So yeah, this is just a very satisfying game. Oh my gosh, I can't not mention this. Uh, well, first of all, bag building, great. Yeah, I love having a nice cloth bag, but this little thing over here that which tracks how many uh, points you have and how many haints you need to kill to get points. This like spoon tracker where it you, you rotate it this way to track your points and then you rotate the spoon to show how many haints you got to kill to get your points. Oh yeah, there's so many things in this game that are just like satisfying, like those those uh, satisfying video compilations, and uh, it's it's that in board game form. So, Harrow County, the game of Gothic conflict, number four. Okay, um, something that only you would know, you specifically. Ah, uh, gosh, I guess I've never known the answer to this question. Um, how many are in a baker's dozen? 13. Okay, perfect. I mean, sounds right to me. You are free to go. <laughs> Great, thanks. Thanks? Not thank you, chef? Number three, Nemesis. Yeah, this one, this one, this one's pretty big. This one's large, takes up a good amount of table space, good amount of stuff included in this game. But before we talk about the stuff, let's talk about the game. Nemesis is a uh, much beloved board game that is super, super thematic. You wake up aboard the Nemesis, that's the name of the ship, with a couple other crew members. And there's a few things that you have to do to make sure that you're not going to die. You gotta go to the back of the ship, make sure the engines are working, head to the front of the ship, make sure you're actually heading to Earth and not somewhere else. And then simultaneously, you need to evade the aliens that are all over the ship. But that's not all because you never know if your fellow crewmates want you to be dead. So uh, kind of a lot going on. And that is that is actually what I just said, a lot going on that is extremely true about this game. There are a ton of rules. There are rules for fire spreading across the ship, making noise as you move from room to room, uh, malfunctioning rooms. There is there's rules for you being slimed or sending a signal. You get 
wounds that are either light or serious, and if they're light, they just kind of stack up, but if they're serious, they can actually have like a, a detrimental effect on what you're allowed to do on your turn. There are multiple different objectives and types of objectives. There are items that you can hold in one hand or they're too heavy, and so you need to hold them in two hands. There is a ton going on in this game, but I think from my experience, once you get through the pretty substantial rules overhead, the thematic experience that this game allows you to enjoy is pretty remarkable. Let's talk a little bit about the components and the slight um, production value that you see before you here. Feel like your eyes probably first go to the miniatures. That is fair. There are multiple different sculpts for the adult aliens. They do not all look the same, which is just a, a cool touch that they didn't need to do, but absolutely adds to the, the value that it feels uh, to play the game. Obviously, the alien queen, a pretty incredible thing. Even the creepers and the larva aliens look great. And then there's the player characters. There's six playable, uh, like, roles in the game, and they all have unique sculpts, obviously smaller than the aliens, but still crammed a ton of great detail into those little miniatures. Then aside from the miniature stuff, everything else, like there's there's no, nowhere does this game really miss. There are the little cardboard doors, which may appear a little bit dinky, but if you want to spend whatever it is, like $40, $50, you can get plastic doors as well, <laughs> if that is something that you would like to do. Of course, we have to mention the candy-like noise and fire tokens. There's also these great malfunction tokens, which look incredible. There's these plastic beads uh, that track the where you are on various tracks. All the cards are nice. There's a freaking... Uh, decoder from like, I don't know, back when you were in middle school and you were pretending to be a spy and so you got decoder toys. Uh, there are those that let you determine whether or not you're infected, not infected, very good to know. And yeah, I mean, why, why? There is a card holder for each player for some reason. There is a stand to put the box on included in the game. What? This game, is it a little bit overproduced? No, it, you need all of it. It's all essential. Yeah, it's a bit overproduced. It's, uh, there are elements of this that are kind of stupid, how ridiculously extravagant they have gotten. And yet, boy oh boy, when you pull this thing out, when you show your friends what you're about to play, they're in. It helps, I think, uh, alleviate the quite substantial rules overhead by saying, okay, bear with me though, because once we're done explaining the rules, you get to touch all this stuff. And that is a pretty appealing uh, deal for a lot of people, I gotta say. So Nemesis, yeah, it's it's a lot, but we're, we're talking about the most beautiful games. We're not talking about the, uh, the most streamlined, trimmed down games, except when I bring up Raptor and Root. Uh, we're talking about beautiful things, and this is indeed a beautiful thing. Nemesis had to be on this list. Number three. Number two, Inish. Before I talk about how this game earned a spot on the list with admittedly kind of middling uh, components, let's talk about how the game works. Inish, which that is the correct pronunciation, as a uh, YouTube commenter informed me. I was calling it Inish, and that's wrong, apparently. Inish is a uh, kind of central mechanism is card drafting. The cards have the actions that you'll play on them. So you, you start with a hand of cards and you say, I'm gonna keep this one, pass them along. You get a hand of cards from somebody else and then you keep one, pass them along, etc. So that when the game starts and you start playing those cards, you have a general idea of what cards are in the game, who might have what, and it, can lead to some pretty incredibly thinky, strategic moments. And aside from the look, this game is so freaking solid. I love this game so very, very much. Uh, the actions, my, my favorite thing, 
is that there are one or two action cards that everyone covets. There's like a, a just say no action card where you play it and you block the action that someone else just wanted to take. And there is a dig through the discard pile and take an action card for yourself card. And both of those are super coveted by all players around the table. So if you don't see them during that initial drafting, you're just waiting. You know that they're there. And you're trying to suss out who has them. Gosh, like there is, I don't think it's necessarily intended to be like a deduction game, but that does come into play in the midst of strategizing and, and mobilizing your clans and moving them around to take the territories that you want. Ooh, it's just, it's just good. Plus you can have a party in a place and um, people who fight when there's a party are sadder than those who fight when there's not a party. And that's so thematic, I, I love it. So with that said, let's talk about why this is on this list with, like I said, not the greatest miniatures. Look at these miniatures. Are they bad? No, but they're just fine. Uh, I do like the sanctuaries and the citadels and the capital. I think those look pretty cool. But the, the player miniatures, the clan miniatures, they're fine. Like they're nothing to write home about. Also, the cardboard tokens, they're a nice like thickness and they, they feel pretty good, but again, nothing really crazy here. What is crazy about this game is the artwork, and it is so good that even despite the uh, lack of you know, standout components in some, some other areas, it had to be on this list, and for me, it had to be this high. The artwork is so good freaking good. It is uh, Dimitri Bilak on the locations, and then it is Jim Fitzpatrick on the uh, card art and the box art. Um, both of them did an incredible job, and again, like I've talked about for some other games where there's kind of two disparate styles coming into play, either like spooky and cartoony or whatever. Uh, this is like very... Um, natural, realistic, painted uh, nature scenes for the locations, and then the artwork on the cards. Like, take a look at this. It is very stylized, very vibrant, very colorful, uh, and unlike any art in any other board game that I have personally played, like, this is, it's not a look that I am familiar with uh, in, in board gaming, but it is so gorgeous. It's just incredible. I love looking at these cards. The cards are the other thing where like component wise, there is a distinct quality to these cards. They are bigger than your average cards and they feel pretty good and chunky to play uh, and to hold them in your hand. You feel, you feel powerful holding a, a hand of these cards, but it really is those two equally beautiful but drastically different styles of artwork that I would love to get some prints, put them up on my wall. Honestly, I'm moving in uh, like six, five or six months. Maybe I'll like try to find a print of some of these things and like get artwork. I love the look of this game. And same thing for the next one. Like maybe I'll have this and then the, my number one, I'll get some artwork from those. That's not a bad idea, actually. Thank you for suggesting that. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, just... Artwork that is so beautiful that despite maybe some slightly more lackluster components in other areas, it just had to be on this list. I think it's it's just that good. So, Inish, number two. Number one, Unmatched. And here we are at the top, and could it have been anything other than a game that is truly unmatched in quality? <laughs> Thank you for the but in post. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, Editor Ben. We also have a cat here. Um, this is not the one that's been causing problems. This is the good one. Unmatched. Let's talk about the game before we talk about the looks. We gotta, we gotta see what's, uh, what's, what's within before we look at what's without, right? Don't judge a book by its cover. All of this cover, <laughs> pretty sweet. You'll notice that I said unmatched as like a whole and not unmatched Cobble and Fog. This is that's what you're looking at right here. This is all stuff from the Cobble and Fog set, but. It is unmatched as a whole game system. I think the quality is consistent across the board with the exception of a couple things that I'll talk about uh, when I talk about the look of the game. Um, I think you mostly can't go wrong uh, aesthetics wise with any unmatched set. 
How do you play the game? Well, you will take control of one of the fighters in the box that you own. And if you own multiple boxes, you are more than welcome to mix and match. Yes, you can absolutely see what happens when Dracula and the T-Rex from Jurassic Park square off. Uh, and you will want to because, I mean, a vampire versus a dinosaur? Sign me up. Uh, it is super simple gameplay. Uh, you'll have a hand of cards and you will, there's three different actions that you can take. There are scheme actions, which is a card that just lets you do like the action listed on them. There's the attack action, which if you are a melee character, if you're up against someone, if you're right next to somebody, you can punch them. If you're a ranged character, if you're in the same zone, you can shoot at them. And the other action that you can take is maneuver, which means that you will draw a card and then you can move up to your movement speed. That's it. That's the whole game. Uh, when you knock your opponent down to zero health, you have won. And that's in a two player game. There are also three and four player games, but I mostly think of Unmatched as a two player game. I've got it set up as a four player game because, you know, it looks nice. But uh, in my mind, Unmatched is a two player game first and foremost. And those other modes, while they're not, I don't think they're like technically variants. I think of them as kind of variants to the like main two player mode, which is what I think of. Uh, that's unmatched. It's super quick, super fun. Uh, it says on the box 20 to 40 minutes. I don't know that I've ever had a game take the full 40 minutes. It's usually like 25, 30 minutes. And so you just like pull out a bunch of fighters that you'd like to see go up against each other and you just cycle through them and fight your buddies. And it's a great time. I think this is, this is a really solid purchase, especially if you are, um, like if you're newer to the hobby, it's not super complicated, but it's quite fun. The fighters are drastically different in what they do and how they feel to play. And so that is very exciting. And you can also start small. Like there are there are two fighter boxes, like uh, Bigfoot versus Robin Hood or the Jurassic Park Raptors versus InGen. Uh, and so you can start with like a $30 investment, just see if you like it. And then if you do, <laughs> The the uh, the people at Mondo Games and Restoration Games they will allow you to spend more money if you like. <laughs> they definitely give you that option. Okay, let's talk about the look. Um, looks good. Looks really really good. The miniatures I think are good, solid miniatures. Not like the most incredible minis in the world, but they're they're quality. Uh, the wash on them is nice. Helps the detail stand out. Um, but I don't think they're the, the main draw. I do like the little tokens for the sidekicks. I think I, I just like little chips. Uh, big fan of plastic chips. Uh, here, here you go, Chip Theory Games. Send me your games, please. I'd love to get them for free. Um, it's a little pitch for you. Um, sounds like, yeah, it sounds like you benefit a lot from that relationship. Uh, also these health dials. I love dials. Dials are great. Uh, and they're nice quality dials in here. Boards always good. Artwork is nice, but the main draw I think of unmatched is going to be the cards and specifically the incredible artwork on these cards. And, uh, before I show you the incredible artwork on these cards, a little teaser for the future. Uh, I'll just briefly say some of the Marvel Unmatched sets, I feel like stray away from what I love about Unmatched artwork up to that point. I think it's the, the Teen Spirit set and the For King and Country sets specifically with maybe uh, the Redemption, no, not Redemption Row, I think is pretty solid. It's the uh, Hell's Kitchen one as well that kind of all the Marvel sets in a way stray away from what I love. And so here's what I love. Take a look at this stuff. What I love about the unmatched artwork is how expressive and inventive and subjective, like these are, these are artistic moments. These are not necessarily like, this isn't a screenshot of something that's happening in the world. These are depictions that evoke the feeling that the artist wanted to evoke. Like, uh, look at this Dracula card that I'm looking at. I'll show it to you. This is, I, this isn't a moment. It's, it's, it's representative of the forms that Dracula can take. Like you can see the wolf, you can see the bat. There's this beautiful symmetry to the image and it's not meant to be like, this is just a photo of a bat. 
No, it's it's meant to evoke the power, the the majesty of Dracula. And all of the artwork in so many of the sets is just like that, where it evokes the feeling of the card so remarkably well. And in just such a, a beautiful way, I think this art is so artistically just gorgeous and smart and you just want to stare at it i feel like whenever i open a new set the first thing that i do is i just like break open the cards and i'll just like flip through them and just look at all the different artwork because that is as exciting to me as playing the actual game is looking at the art on these cards so like i said for inish i think i would absolutely like to get some prints of this artwork uh for for my for my new place when i move that would be that'd be cool there's some good stuff in here unmatched the stupid joke that i made at the start it is really like unmatched in quality i think this is one of the best bangs for your buck in terms of the look and in terms of the fun that you get playing the game number one I just forgot to say it. I, I know that there are eight ounces in a cup and, and poultry needs to reach 165 degrees. And uh, 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 my work, it's not done. But here, uh, you can use that to induce the eyes of Avenir. It'll only work on the originals, the first Ben and the first Neb. I have to go. I'll see you soon. Uh. No. Blood without wound, wound without pain. That which is many becomes one again. If good is to breathe, evil must grow. The first journey ends. On fresh fallen snow. <sighs> Whoa, that was absolutely crazy, but that'll about do it for this week's Board and Savior video. Make sure to leave a comment down below. Let me know what your most gorgeous games are. Anything to add, Eyes of Avenir? <laughs> Make sure to like and subscribe. Good stuff. Bye.